Let's just cut to the chase, friends. While the rest of the world is getting ready to see Black Panther Wakanda forever in a few months, I've got my eyes set to the movie right after it, Ant-Man Quantumania. Why should I care about the third movie in the Ant-Man trilogy? Oh, because that's where Ant-Man is gonna die, and I'm about to prove it to you. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, where the smallest details transform into huge pieces of evidence. Case in point, today's episode. You see, even before this year's Comic-Con, it had been pretty well established that Kang the Conqueror was going to be the MCU's next Thanos-level overarching threat. There's been no shortage of articles and interviews confirming that when it comes to Marvel, this is the guy that you're going to need to watch out for. And now that the next Avengers movie is straight up called the Kang Dynasty, forget about it. Case closed. So far, we've only gotten our first tease of Kang in the MCU as this big, overexcited exposition dump during the final episode of Loki. But in the comics, he's actually a multiversal warmonger. A guy who lives with the unlimited lives cheat code on. Not only does Kang have infinite violent variants floating around the infinite timelines, Kang's future technology is so advanced that he's able to transfer his consciousness to a new body at the moment of his death. The dude's like Rick Sanchez minus the existential apathy. And don't get me wrong, a citadel of Rick's versus Avengers showdown is certainly interesting in theory, but it ultimately might ring hollow if there's no stakes behind it. Thanos wasn't just an era-defining villain because he was powerful. If we learned anything from that galaxy-brained grimace, a box office mega-villain needs to earn their place by altering the status quo drastically. They need to prove that they're an existential threat to our favorite plot-armored heroes. They need to make our blood boil with the rage of revenge and the fear of loss. In short, someone's gotta get dusted. Kang has to prove himself as the next major threat by killing off a beloved hero. And that hero is going to be Ant-Man. Yep, I predict that Ant-Man, in the final movie of his trilogy, is going to get exterminated like a bug. Which, you know, is it's it's fitting. First, let's start things off by examining the general story structure of the MCU. You no, know, you can't get to the end until you've been changed by the journey. Thanks for that, Kang. See, this guy knows what he's talking about. Now, I mean absolutely no disrespect to Stan Lee stands by saying this, but the MCU runs on some pretty tried and true story formulas. At this point, I think it's pretty fair to say that we're all at least vaguely familiar with the narrative beats of the iconic hero's journey. Call to adventure, find a mentor, death and rebirth that results in some sort of a transformation, atonement, and then returning back to the beginning changed as a result. Classic stuff been done to death. But exactly like that, overarching end bosses hit key beats in their stories as well. You can certainly see the pattern in self-contained stories, but it's especially apparent when you start looking at memorable big baddies of epic adventure franchises. First, the big villain appears in a film technique that Steven Spielberg likes to call the Fraction introduction. This is where the audience is teased about the mystery surrounding this new character. For Thanos, this Fraction tease came as his cameo at the end of the first Avengers film, pegging him as the true mastermind behind Loki's Chitauri invasion. Harry Potter had evil Lord Voldemort appearing as just a face on the back of Professor Quirrell's head at the end of the first movie. Showing the big boss as the motivating force for a lesser antagonist is a common trope that's used to express this particular plot point. Think of Fire Lord Ozai's silhouette ordering Zuko to hunt down the Avatar, or Grand Moff Tarkin name-dropping the Emperor in A New Hope. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. Implying that even Darth Vader answers to someone higher up on the food chain. As the plot moves into Act 2, we're given a taste of the villain's true power. It's common for writers to give us hints of this through the use of specific story beats known as pinch points. These pinch points are moments that amp up the narrative tension by putting our heroes in a jam through increasing doses of the villain's intensifying presence. Traditionally, there are two major pinch points that happen on on opposite ends of a story's second act. The first is usually early in Act 2, and is just a simple reminder of the villain's strength. The second foreshadows the biggest complication that the villain will throw at our heroes. Oftentimes, an important character gets killed in the process. In Harry Potter, the first key pin showcasing the threat of Voldemort is the death of Cedric Diggory in Goblet of Fire. The second pinch point comes when Dumbledore himself is killed off in movie 6, right before the final push towards the end battle. For the Infinity Saga, Thanos' first pinch point comes comes when he enlists Ronan the Accuser to get the Power Stone in Guardians of the Galaxy. Through Ronan, we are given the glimpse of the destruction that'll spread throughout the universe as Thanos completes his rock collection. The second pinch point is at the start of Infinity War, when Thanos decimates the Asgardians, boxes the previously unbeatable Hulk into retirement, and drives home that even the slippery Loki can't escape his inevitability. Loki's death is the linchpin of the pinch point. Without it, the stakes wouldn't be high enough for the audience to care. In one scene, Thanos decimates what of otherwise been
been indestructible heroes, giving us a sense of the real threat that he poses. Which brings us then to their moment of victory. After years of scheming in the shadows, the villain finally achieves their goal. When it comes to sprawling franchise level narratives, this moment often happens in the second to last installment, leaving us on a cliffhanger so that both fans and heroes have to sit through their darkest hour for years waiting for resolution. Just think about the king of this trope, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, where Han ends the movie as a big ol' ice cube and Luke loses a hand. For the Infinity Saga, this moment is when Thanos bests Earth's mightiest heroes and dusts half the universe. This structure achieves two purposes. First, it underlines the strength of the threat, but more importantly, it turns our heroes into underdogs. It's not certain whether or not they'll be able to prevail. The next installment, then, means that the heroes have to win back every inch of the world that they wish to fix, ultimately making the climactic battle feel that much more earned. So, those are your lessons from the screenplay. And, according to this time-tested story formula, we can look at Kang's confirmed appearances in the MCU to deduce how he might be similarly utilized across multiple movies in order to truly rise to the role of the next big bad. Right now, we've seen Kang's first teaser moment in the season 1 Loki finale, and boy was that a journey on its own. Throughout the season, we see timelines getting deleted, Infinity Stones turning into meaningless rocks, and a hangry cloud monster that devours all matter. This leads us to the Citadel at the end of time, a big scary castle with big dramatic doors and a massive tension building elevator. With the entire series building to this moment, Loki has reached the one pulling the strings behind the whole operation. The elevator doors open and Kang. It's his Thanos first reveal moment. And this isn't even a particularly violent Kang either. Sure, he's created a big brother organization run by puppets that prunes entire timelines, but he tells us that all of this is to keep his other more violent selves at bay. If you think I'm evil, just wait till you meet my very with just one timeline, there's just one Kang, and he warns that his death is gonna unleash a Pandora's box of crueler variants. So, of course, he dies, only to have everything start to unravel. Looking more broadly, right now the multiverse is in flux with movies like No Way Home and Multiverse of Madness. While Kang isn't connected to either of those events, yet, those movies are already priming us for Kang's impending multiversal war. We're starting to learn the rules and the dangers that accompany wild multiversal collisions, just like the Infinity Saga introduced us one by one to the powers and dangers of the individual stones via movies that were completely disconnected from Thanos. The Reality Stone in Thor 2, the Time Stone in Doctor Strange, the Tesseract in Avengers, the Power Stone in Guardians. That way, when everything comes together with Kang, all the rule setting and world building has already been done in previous movies. All of this means that, if we consult the handy dandy story cheat sheet, the next time we'll be interacting with Kang will be the pinch points. And hey, wouldn't you know it, but we have two projects next year that have that pair of pinch points. One of these has to be Loki Season 2, due out in mid-2023. This one's obvious because at the end of Season 1 of Loki, we see giant Kang statues in the new layout of the rebooted TVA. Safe to say that Kang is going to play a huge role in Loki's return, which means that there's going to be plenty of time to get those pinches in. But the other pinch point is going to come even sooner than that, with Quantumania's release in February of 2023, and that one is going to be the death pinch. This is why. And here's where the theory gets interesting. Loyal theorists, I submit to you Exhibit A, a minor leaked image from Quantumania's pre-production. These shirts were allegedly made for Quantumania's stunt team, depicting a broken Ant-Man helmet and the reflection of Kang the Conqueror ominously charging an energy blast. Now, third installments of MCU films historically end with the destruction of a hero's iconic equipment. Iron Man 3 had Tony hit the fireworks button on his whole iron closet, Captain America Civil War had Steve Rogers renounce his shield, and Thor Ragnarok shattered Mjolnir like it was made out of Lego. What this means is that Scott Lang might just be left to face the nearly immortal time demigod Kang with only his wits. And, huh, well, those aren't great odds. And I'm not the only one to notice the power imbalance here. Back in October of 2021, Jonathan Majors, actor for Kang the Conqueror, was interviewed on the late night show Jimmy Kimmel. When he's questioned on how Ant-Man would possibly be able to contend with someone of Kang's power, we get this. No offense to Ant-Man, but Kang, if Kang is a Thanos, yeah, it's like squash. Ant-Man's dead. We'll see. Look at that face. Seems to me that Kimmel guessed right, and Majors gives him a little too much reveal with that facial response. That, my friends, is a man who has realized that Kevin Feige's snipers are on the way. So, from a narrative angle, it's the perfect time for Ant-Man to die. We have t-shirts from the production showing that Ant-Man is gonna get wrecked, and we have Kang's actor giving us some guilty vibes in interviews. But there's still one more piece of evidence that you need to see. Avengers number 500. The first part of the Avengers disassembled comic arc that brought 
brought about an end to the Avengers team. Spoiler alert, in this issue, Ant-Man dies. Now, admittedly, it isn't at the hands of Kang the Conqueror, but the ripple effects of his death end up playing an important role in both Kang's development and the evolution of the Avengers. You see, Scott Lang's death is very comic booky. He's killed when the zombie corpse of his best friend unexpectedly explodes. This all turns out to be the result of a grieving Scarlet Witch inadvertently tampering with the fabric of reality. But it's not the how of this comic that's important, it's the why. You see, Scott's death is incredibly important because it's the catalyst that sets in motion the formation of the Young Avengers. One of the key members is Scott's daughter, Cassie Lang, who is so moved by Scott's death that she takes up the Ant-Man legacy under the codename Stature and forms the team in order to avenge him. And hey, wouldn't you know it, but the Quantum Mania poster and footage from Comic-Con showed us that Cassie is gonna suit up just like her dad in the new movie. It doesn't hurt that the Cassie actress from Endgame also got recast with a bigger name, too, without even telling said actress that she was being recast. Bad luck there, Marvel. Bad luck. Now, it's pretty clear that the Young Avengers are coming to the big screen. Nearly every Phase 4 property has introduced or will introduce a potential Young Avenger, many of whom are the founding members of the team in the comics. WandaVision gave us Billy and Tommy, aka Wiccan and Speed. Hawkeye gave us Kate Bishop. Loki opened the door for Kid Loki. Multiverse of Madness gave us America Chavez. And Falcon and the Winter Soldier gave us Patriot. Heck, I wouldn't be surprised if Hulkling pops up in She-Hulk or Secret Invasion. Then you also have to consider the potential applications of Ms. Marvel and Ironheart, who are coming, and teens, and prime candidates for the MCU's Young Avengers lineup. Clearly, the building blocks for this team are being assembled. Now, we just need the event that gets them all together. Ant-Man's death, just like in the comics. But you want to know the real clincher? Kang is actually the first villain that the Young Avengers take on in the comics. It's only fitting that he play a role in their live-action debut. And to go even more subatomic on this theory, if Kang the Conqueror's run-in with Ant-Man goes as badly for Scott as I think it's gonna, that one kill doesn't just mold the villain that all these new heroes are gonna have to band together against in Phase 5, it's also gonna shape the entirety of Phase 6. What if, unlike Thanos, Kang gets a redemption arc and becomes a young Avenger? You see, Kang has a zillion variants, but one of them is a young Avenger. In fact, he's their first leader. A teen variant of Kang, going by the alias Iron Lad, forms the team in hopes that he can divert himself from growing up to become a megalomaniac that brings about the destruction of the multiverse. Iron Lad even has a close, sometimes romantic, relationship with Cassie Lang in the comics. This poses an interesting conflict if Kang turns out to be the one to squash Ant-Man. At their core, the Ant-Man movies are thematically about second chances. Scott is an ex-felon who's given a second lease on life. Hank Pym gets a second chance at saving his wife Janet. The Ant family helps save and redeem Ghost in the second film. If Kang kills Cassie's father, she's put in a scenario where she may have to give her father's killer a preemptive second chance as well. So if Cassie chooses to forgive young Kang, that may be the push Iron Lad needs to avoid his dark future, saving the multiverse from adult Kang in the process. Or maybe the second chance Kang gets in Quantumania is at killing Scott. When they meet during the trailer shown at Comic-Con, Scott introduces himself to Kang as an Avenger. Kang's response? You're an Avenger. Have I killed you before? So when Ant-Man starts advertising itself like yet another quirky superhero comedy star in Paul Rudd, you'll know the truth. At some point, that thing is gonna take a serious turn and pull the rug out from under you, stomping the main man himself out of existence. Either that or, you know, Ant-Man shrinks himself and hops up Kang's But Hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.